Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to return to the series, Jesus is Better. We're, we're anchoring this in the book of Hebrews. But as we get into the message this morning, what do you think of when you consider the Old Testament? You know, the Old Testament is a great collection of books that are rich in the, the history and the heritage of God. The Old Testament is God's heart. The Old Testament contains words of comfort and challenge. It gives light. It gives guidance to us. It instructs us. It teaches us. The Old Testament really is a directory for living. Because the Old Testament speaks about things that were yet to come in the form of prophecies and promises. But by the time you get to the end of the Old Testament, it leaves you with the feeling, hey, there's something yet to come. And we may make a mistake sometimes in drawing too great of a distinction between the Old Testament and the New. Now, I know there were 400, what they call basically, they refer to 400 years of silence between the end of, of Malachi or the period of, of, the, of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. But the truth is, the Old simply leads us into the New. The New Testament is a wonderful complement to the Old. And all of the prophecies, all of the promises that are made in the Old Testament, they're either fulfilled or they're, they're given new meaning in the New Testament. So the New Testament had to be written in order to vindicate the faithfulness of God. Now, we tend to call ourselves a New Testament church. But the New Testament by itself is incomplete. Many times we read these words, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. The words in the Old Testament point forward to the new, but the words in the New Testament remind us of the promises of the old. You've got all kinds of Bible characters who are referenced and incidents that are remembered in such a way that if it were not for the knowledge we have of the Old Testament, a lot of the New Testament wouldn't make any sense. So it, it, here's what I'm saying. The Old and New Testament are interdependent. They are woven together and, and both have a strong family resemblance. And it's a lot closer than second cousins removed. And all throughout the writings, you see the character and the holiness of God shining through all of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul referred to the Old Testament record of God as he dealt with the children of Israel as they journeyed from Egypt to Canaan. So far in our Hebrew study, we have used them as a reference. And we've talked about their story. But Paul, in writing about them in Corinthians, pointed out their failures and their sinfulness. And he links them in with these verses. Verses 6 to 10 of 1 Corinthians 10. It says, These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did. And then were destroyed by the angel of death. And then look what he adds in verse 11. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. In other words, the Holy Spirit points us back to the Old Testament, especially to the experiences of the children of Israel, and says all of the things that happened to them are examples of the way that you may behave, and these things are, reward, are recorded to serve as a warning to you. As Ripley says, it's amazing but true. You can read the story of the wandering Israelites and find yourself in the story. 
That's why we need to take warning. Because we don't want to experience the consequences of similar failure. And if you happen to think you are above failure, let's add verse 12 from 1 Corinthians. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. You see, that warning must really be important to the heart and the mind of God. Because He sent it not to Christians who are in danger of falling from the path, But it's addressed to those who think they are continuing to stand firm. Here's what was happening. God was using the records of the Old Testament as a textbook for personal Christian living. And he directs these warnings here to those who think you are standing strong. Beloved, this is a message that the church of the 21st century desperately needs to hear today. In this particular period of history, we are told that personal behavior has nothing to do with character and performance. Beloved, listen to me. The personal life of the believer needs to be centered on personal purity, morality, and victory. That should be the great, one of the greatest priorities in the church today. Jack, great sermon last Sunday. The, the, the need for evangelism today is, is high. It, it is deep. And the truth is there has never been as much evangelistic activity as there is today. And the Church of God Universal seems to recognize this need And there are so many methods that are available to present the gospel. In fact, the truth is it's relatively easy to hear the gospel today if you just open your ears. But more and more I realize, now now this is not, I don't want this to sound contradictory to what you said last week, but hear me. Evangelism for evangelism's sake isn't enough. Behind the evangelistic effort, there has to be a walk. There has to be a life of personal holiness and purity. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, Jesus said, Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so can you identify people by their actions. It's easy to get taken in by the size of a tree or by the beautiful shapes and the colors of the leaves. But Jesus said, it's by their fruit you will identify them. You know, it's interesting in reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians here. So many times, he uses pronouns so well in it because sometimes he includes himself in the dangers of of failure. He says, I'm capable of failing. Uh, There are other times he basically puts the onus on the readers as the ones being in danger. Let me me give you a couple examples. In verse 6, he said, these things happened as a warning to us. He includes himself here. So that we would not crave evil things as they did. So see, he includes himself here. He acknowledges, I still have the potential of weakness in the area of temptation. But then in verse 7, he says, do not worship idols. And he excludes himself. And it makes sense, because this is the same man who has said, for me to live is Christ. So he's not one who's going to be found guilty of idolatry. His heart and mind are set there. But then in the very next verse, he acknowledges again his own fleshly weakness, where he said, we must not engage in sexual immorality. And then in verse 9, he says, nor should we put Christ to the test. So I want you to see this. He He makes himself a possibility as a victim. And then in verse 10, he says, and don't grumble. He didn't include himself here. 
This is the same man, by the way, who said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. So he's not prone to grumble when things would go wrong. But he kind of sums it all up by saying, all of these things have been written for our admonition, and they all apply to me as well. And knowing all these things and putting all of this together, he kind of really grounds it in verse 12 when he says, so if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. You know what Paul is admitting? He's saying, I haven't arrived yet. I'm not too big for such a warning. But there are a lot of people who think they've advanced past that. You know, we live in, in such a technical civilization. A civilization that has, give, has given us personally all the answers to moral failure. Uh-uh. This is the very kind of thinking that Paul is warning us about. And it's a warning the church needs to hear today. The message in 1 Corinthians 10, the, those first 12 verses, is a warning with a sense of urgency. And the question is, are we, in this present day and generation, following the same pattern as the children of Israel? In Psalm 78, God uses the same method to teach His people of that generation. He was reminding the Israelites of that era, the whole story about the children of Israel, how they were delivered from Egypt, and how God had brought them up to that very time. Let me read some of that passage to you. This is verses 4 to 8. The psalmist said, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. For He issued His laws to Jacob. He gave His instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting His glorious miracles and obeying His commands. They will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. And then verse 41 says, Again and again they tested God's patience and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Do you know what these people were doing? You know, the, the writer is talking about Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt. Once they were delivered from Egypt, you know what they began to do? They began to put handcuffs on God. They began to restrict what He was able to do. They told the Creator of all things what He could and could not do for them. And out of their own free will... They closed themselves off in the wilderness. It wasn't that God wasn't strong enough or powerful enough. His people deliberately chose to restrict Him. You know how you restrict God? Two very, very ways, two ways in particular. One, you restrict what God can do for you and you restrict what God can do through you. In Deuteronomy 1, in verse 2, we read this. Now, the key into this, I want you to... I'm fixing to give you a little Bible history lesson here that you may not have ever thought about. And when it, make, and, and when it comes through and it makes sense to you, you, it makes you realize how foolish the children of Israel were. Listen to this. Normally, it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, going by way of Mount Seir. That's how far they were from the promised land. 11 days travel. But now look at verse 3. But 40 years after, 
The Israelites left Egypt on the first day of the 11th month. Do you understand what this is saying? What should have taken them 11 days, 40 years later, they still haven't reached Canaan. What could have been accomplished in less than two weeks took 40 years. And it's because they handcuffed God. You know, their movement should have been constantly progressing forward. They should have been counting on God's promises every moment. They should have been expecting one great blessing after another. But their trip became a dismal failure. They stopped progressing and started wandering. And they lost vision. They lost sight of the promised land. And they were content to settle for less. You know what comes in with discontent? Dissatisfaction. Disappointment. Disaster. Disobedience. All these things hit them because they accepted them as the norm for their lives. They restricted what God could do. You go a little farther over into Deuteronomy 6 and verse 21, it tells you what an Israelite was supposed to say to his son if he was questioned. Verse 21 says, you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. And then verse 23 says, He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. Beloved, listen, listen. God's purpose was to, live, was to deliver them out of Egypt and bring them into Canaan. It was supposed to be just a continuous movement, as it were, to just go from Egypt right into Canaan. And God's intention was, was to get them out of Egypt's bondage and into Canaan's freedom. See, his redemption for his people was not in Egypt. And it wasn't in the wilderness. It was supposed to be in Canaan. But the Bible says they handcuffed him. Not only in their progress, but in their possessions. There was so much more God could have done for them. There was so much more He was willing to do for them. But because they were stubborn and because of their, their, their sinful free will, they restricted Him. They wanted to do things their way. And so they just disregarded all the warnings God had given them. They ignored the very one who wanted to take care of them and wanted to bless them. It's amazing. Th think about where they started. From the day they took their first step out of Egypt, that moment they possessed nothing, yet everything was theirs. You hear me? promised land is ahead. And when we get there, all the pastures are ours. All the hills are ours. All the cities are ours. Everything is ours. The moment we step out of Egypt, all they had to do was take possession of their promise. Do you remember the story of Balaam? If you don't, it's in the book. Read it. Balaam was called by uh, Balak to call down a curse on Israel. But God said to Balaam, you must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. Oh yeah, they were blessed all right, but they weren't claiming their blessing. They were accepting defeat as a normal way of life. And because of this, they were restricting what God was able to do for them. They were making no progress, and they had no possessions. And the tragedy, beloved, was they had chosen this as their way. God could have done so much 
more for them, but they handcuffed him and they suffered the consequences. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, is, is a warning that Paul gives the church in Corinth that the same thing could happen to us if we're not careful. Listen to verse 11. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Here's what I believe Paul is trying to say. All of us have been redeemed from Egypt. We've been delivered from a world that held us in the bondage of sin. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, sent as a sacrifice for our salvation. And just as it was with Old Testament Israel, God has brought us out so that he could bring us in. God's plan is to deliver us from the bondage of sin and lead us completely into a new life in Christ. Read 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That means if I am a true child of God, I am in Christ. In John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus prayed this prayer. I am praying not only for those disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. By the way, that's you and me. Okay? Verse 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, and you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Listen, if I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, then I am in Him. And if I am in Him, I am a new creation. The old things are gone. New things have come. And notice, this is true now, according to God's purpose. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. It doesn't say you will be. It says you are Right now, Amen. in this moment, God brought us out of sin so that he might bring us into Christ. He brought us out so that he might bring us in. But a lot of Christians are stuck in the wilderness. The Bible says that all things are ours in Christ. But just like the Israelites... We restrict what God can do. Just as they put limits on God by not making progress, many Christians in the 21st century today are content to live a wilderness kind of Christianity, a faith that just kind of wanders around. If you ever look at a map of the 40 years sojourning, the Israelites literally wandered in circles for 40 years. This is so true of so many current day Christ followers in churches. There may be a lot of activity, but activity doesn't necessarily mean progress. And when it's examined for progress, in spiritual grace and in truth, there's really not a whole lot to show. A lot of leaves, a lot of pretty flowers, but no fruit. Why? Because we just don't go forward and make progress. There's a particular verse of Scripture I think applies here. It's Colossians 2 and verse 6. So then... Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. And the King James says, continue to walk in Him. Listen, living and walking isn't wandering. Living and walking imply progress. So here's the secret of progress. 
Are you, are you ready for this? Here it comes. As you have received, live. As you've received, walk. You know, when I came to Jesus at the, at the age of 17, I realized I was a sinner. But at a moment of crisis in my life, I was challenged by the gospel and I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Now, in that moment, I did not accept a creed. I didn't join a church. I didn't ask to be voted on. I accepted a person. For God so loved Danny Piner that as he loved him so much that he gave his only son that Danny Piner would believe in him, that Danny Piner should not perish and have eternal life. He gave me this gift. He offered me his son, and I accepted it. I received Christ. And not only did I believe in his work, but I accepted his person. Beloved, listen. Salvation is not about a place, and it's not about a passage. It's about a person. So, so Colossians 2 and 6 tells us, As you have received, live. And how did I receive him? I received him by faith. I came to him completely empty-handed. I had nothing that I could do to try to secure my salvation. I just had the need. That's all I had to offer. But I believed God's answer to my need, and I accepted Christ into my, into my life. And the moment I received him, I was saved. And you know what happened? I was delivered out of Egypt. He freed me from bondage by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I found myself no, no longer in Egypt, but I was in Christ. And because I was in Christ, I became a new creation. Amen. Now, that is perfectly true positionally and potentially. But sometimes it doesn't happen for us practically. Case in point, me. I knelt at that altar, I received Christ, and I stood up, and I declared the, by faith that Christ had saved me. I got a whole new road ahead of me, but I failed to do what I should have done, and that was go forward. I didn't live what I received. You see, I was, I was a bit dumb. I thought that just because I'd received Christ as Savior, now everything in my life is going to be perfect. My sins are forgiven. I've been saved. And so now, if I'll just be a good boy, and if I'll behave myself, I can live this, I can do this thing called the Christian life. You know what that got me? It got me a ticket to wandering. I found myself in my own spiritual wilderness because I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was restricting what God wanted to do in my life. But you see, here's the problem. I thought all of my spiritual success was up to me. I, you know, I thought, if I just work harder at it, if I, if I just discipline myself, if I do my dead level best to serve him, I will. But nothing happened. And I spent a couple of years in my early faith, wandering in the desert. And you know, it wasn't all that pleasing. I wasn't in Egypt anymore. I'd been delivered, but I was miserable. I was just wandering about, and I didn't have any direction whatsoever. And it's the interesting thing about wandering in the wilderness. Every now and then, you stumble on a little oasis. It'll thrill you for a little while. It'll sustain you for a short period of time. But it doesn't bring you real life. I don't know if you've ever been there. Maybe you're there this morning. Well, beloved, the good news is this. Just as you have received Jesus Christ in the same way, 
begin to live every day, day by day, in Him. Walk in Him. Don't wander. Follow. Because Jesus is your Canaan land. God brought you out so that you could be brought into Christ. And that is the secret to progress. Think back, beloved, when you first came to Christ. From that moment, how's the walk been going? How's the living been? Are you continuing to receive Him? Well, beloved, if you are, then you're headed in the right direction. You're, 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 you, you've entered into the promise. But if you're not, it means that you're going to have fears, you're going to have anxieties, you're going to have temptations, you're going to have frustrations, you're going to be facing things, and you're going to try to handle them in your strength. Can I tell you something? That's, it's not your job. To face those things. You are in Christ now. As one guy said, if Christ is in the home of your heart, every time the devil knocks on the door, let Jesus answer it. See, your task is to expose your whole situation to Christ. And then live and walk in a manner that believes what he has promised. And what he has promised, listen, what he's promised, he will provide. This is what 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 means when it says, The old is gone, the new has come. Every one of us, positionally and potentially, are new creations in Christ. But practically, we still want to do the same old things. We, st we, we love to wander. The wilderness is a comfortable home. And it gets us nowhere. But all the things, be but everything becomes new if we walk every day, moment by moment, Receiving all that He is for all that we need. You know, earlier I, I, I said that the need in, exists today for continued increased evangelism. But even more so, we need people who are willing to live the message. I believe one of the church's greatest needs is that those who profess and call themselves Christians live a life that backs up the claim. As 1 Peter 1 and 15 says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. I think that's pretty plain and simple, beloved. It's how you conduct yourself. It's the manner in which you live. And here again, this all takes us back to Colossians 2 and verse 6. So then, just as you received Jesus Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. And it's essential, beloved, that your life and mine be pure and holy. It's not optional. It's essential. And if we allow sin or failure or defeat or any of the other old things to dominate our daily walk, we are handcuffing God from start to finish. If we try to go on in spite of His warnings, we make a farce of our Christian life. We make a fool of ourselves and we end up keeping company with the devil. So, trying to summarize everything we've talked about this morning, it is a tragedy if we are guilty of restricting God in what He wants to do for us. Let me remind you of Deuteronomy 6 and verse 23. He brought us out to bring us in. 
Verse 24 goes on to say, The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive. Beloved, God never limits His blessings to us. The measure of God's unlimited desire to bless us is recorded in Malachi 3 and 10, where God said, Test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room to contain it. Beloved, we have no idea of what God actually wants to give to us, what He wants to do for us. In fact, listen to this verse from Deuteronomy 5 and 29. It really exposes God's heart for us. This is God speaking. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Do you see it? The tragedy of missing the blessing, this restricting that we put on God's goodness to us is all because of our own disobedience. So how do you find yourself this day, beloved, at this moment, are you living it or are you limiting it? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would search our hearts this morning. Help us answer the question honestly. Am I walking or am I wandering? Beloved, if you're living it, if you're walking... Walking in Christ in faith, if you are progressing in Him, you will find that every day is better than the day before. But you may be wandering today. And you may be struggling in trying to make sense of this thing called the, the Christian life. And it's wearing on you heavily. Are you tired of wilderness Christianity? Then come back to the place where it all begins. Come back to the place of your deliverance. Remember, He has brought you out so that you might be brought in. Reestablish yourself in Christ and live it and walk it and make forward progress in Him. I don't have to say a whole lot about this because you know right now at this moment in your own heart and life no one knows better than you if you are walking it or if you're wandering. Remember he brought you out so that He might bring you in. He's delivered you from the old ways of life, from sin, so that you might be brought into Christ and salvation. So, Father, we pray that you give us courage this morning to do what we know is right and what needs to be as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The altars are here. I'm going to ask you to stand as Linda leads us in, in this closing song. But as we come, if you need to pray this morning, beloved, the altars are here. And if you'd like someone to pray with you, if you'd use the altar to your left, if you would just like to spend time alone, you and God, come to the altar that is to your right. If you come to this side, no one will trouble you. But if you need someone to pray with you, come to the altar on the left as we sing.